Good evening. Kublai Khan. Marco, when you return to the West, will you repeat to your people the same tales you tell to me? Marco, I speak and speak, but the listener retains only the words he is expecting. Twenty years ago, two contradictory prognoses resonated in the American architecture discourse. The protagonists, arrayed on both coasts, offered competing pro forma in a contest for control of American architecture's podium. Stan Allen is here tonight to reconstitute the East Coast voice in that debate. Although neither side's performance coda was ever formally defined, the contradictory sensibilities that characterized each coast were readily apparent from the magazine, newspaper, and exhibit exchanges that resonated in the lecture halls, east and west. Here's a thumbnail, <coughs> here's a thumbnail of the dramatic personae. The east, ever self-conscious of its obligation as a source of critical advocacy, had a pedigree to protect. The West announced it was more concerned with shifting the content of design than in debating the merits of that shift. The Eastern protagonists aspired to enlarge America's intellectual tradition. The Western protagonist was the upstart. Lacking a proper pedigree, the West couldn't possibly compete on a theoretical plane, said the East. West Coast building possessed an essential unreality since stick construction could never endure the severe climatic conditions conceptual durability demands. Ergo, whatever the West Coast might originate belong to an intellectually and climatologically narrow zone of the discourse. And from this perspective, Los Angeles architecture was entirely parochial. The West Coast was the equivocal respondent. Los Angeles architecture saw itself as the venue for experiment, unencumbered by the cultural or intellectual precedents that surrounded architecture production on the East Coast. Free to imagine a Los Angeles that was new in a Los Angeles whose citizenry was either open to almost any built project or simply unconcerned with contesting the results. A few West Coast voyagers found teaching assignments on the East Coast where the LA voice began to develop traction. There was little East Coast reciprocal trade here, though on occasion European architects jumped Manhattan and landed in the midst of the West Coast discussion. Perhaps in retrospect, persistent East Coast skepticism exacerbated the polarity between East and West and enlarged the extremism of West Coast production. Twenty years later, the skeptical East has vanished. Mr. Allen is here to confirm, to confirm that reverse polarity. Los Angeles probably won the argument, though to this day it's not clear LA knows. Designated parochial, insufficiently intellectual or unbuildable, Los Angeles architecture is now under construction around the globe. The fragile, iconic projects in Los Angeles built with marginal local support are gone, replaced by larger projects that confirm the prowess of both the architecture and the institutions the architecture presents to the world. Internationalized Los Angeles subscribes to the architecture's original linguistics, but has tempered its radicalism. Once the insular city, the world has ratified Los Angeles architecture. 
And Los Angeles architecture in now, is now in danger of adopting the pedigree, uh, the pedigree syndrome it once disdained. East Coaster Stan Allen is here tonight to remind the West Coast of its continuing commitment to the pedigree rejection premise. If LA once expressed skepticism of an a priori form language, Los Angeles is now in danger of believing in its own. If Los Angeles once expressed a hatred of history, it is now in danger of subscribing to its own. Los Angeles and the architecture as non, of non-allegiance is in danger of becoming its own allegiance. Suspecting the East, Los Angeles architects have forgotten to, to apply the same suspicion to the West. Not long ago, we bent some glass for the LA Philharmonic. The glass cracked, leaked, and collapsed. Today, manufacturers arrive at our doors selling the same bent glass we were told it was impossible to fabricate. The parametric representation process and the latest fabrication and engineering techniques applied as both public relations means and construction ends substantially mitigate construction risk and plop architecture down on an accountant's spreadsheet. We can all make risk adverse look risky, but it's not. The image of experiment reflects the reality of experiment, or it's not experiment. And Stan Allen is here to propose a changing venue for experiment. No longer the social service architects versus the design architects. No more mercantile guys versus avant-garde guys, or East Coast versus West Coast design. Forget all that. I bulldoze the site. I bury the building. I return the topography to its a priori state. Is that sustainable? Stan Allen will help us reimagine that east-west landscape. Please welcome Stan Allen to Sire. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, and nobody ever believes me, but I was actually born in Boulder, Colorado, halfway between the East Coast and the West Coast. So maybe we can complicate this, uh, this division here. Um, they always tell you never explain your title, but I've, I've always uh, ignored good advice. Um, and I wanted to uh, situate this term landscape urbanism. Landscape urbanism has been around for about 10 years. There's a lot of debate and discussion about who invented the term. I'm less interested in that. But it did seem to me that after 10 years, it's a good time to sort of take stock, take stock of what is valuable in landscape urbanism, but also take stock of landscape urbanism's um, uh, potential deficiencies and inadequacies. So, um, and landscape urbanism is an interesting phenomenon in our field. It, it sort of emerged, it was one of those interesting instances where the theory in a way came first. Uh, there's a lot of writings and essays on landscape urbanism. There's a very small number of practitioners and uh, there's beginning to be a kind of catalog of, uh, of projects. So I, I want to take this occasion of a sort of 10 year retrospective look at the practices of landscape urbanism which I was involved to some degree during the beginning, um, and kind of take stock and say, where do we go from here? Hence, after landscape urbanism. But I also want to situate that question in terms of some of the concerns that I was working with before that period and that I think are still present in the work today. And now the other point here is that I'm going to show three large-scale projects that work in the territory of landscape urbanism tonight. Um, but that's a, that represents about half of what we do in the, in the studio. Uh, this house up here on the right, I'm not going to show. It's about 10 minutes from here up in uh, Glendale. 
Um, and we're certainly interested in, in buildings, we're interested in, in, in the whole process of realizing architecture, and so uh, there's a bit of a coda at the end of the uh, lecture that shows some of these building works. So the other part of after landscape urbanism is this before and after landscape urbanism is this continued focus on architecture. Now, the, the people who started thinking about landscape urbanism in the middle 1990s, in a way, were facing a kind of dilemma that you sort of see up here. Uh, the image on the left, very familiar, is, is Central Park in, in, in Manhattan. Uh, the work of Frederick Law Olmsted, this incredibly powerful 19th century landscape architect who really reshaped the city by means of her work on the landscape. You can really say that Central Park structures a major chunk of the city of New York. It's very hard to say that about contemporary landscape architecture. Uh, and this is perhaps a bit of an unfair comparison, but the image on the right is a, a garden by uh, Martha Schwartz uh, in front of the federal uh, building in Lower Manhattan. Uh, and you can see that landscape architecture has been reduced to uh, sort of decorating with some green stuff uh, buildings which in this particular case are, are particularly banal. It's also, uh, this is another reason to choose this image. Uh, some of you may know the history of this. Um, this is the garden that replaced the Richard Serra sculpture, uh, the Tilted Ark, which was torn down because it was seen to be too aggressive, too challenging to the public realm. So again, landscape architecture is called upon to sort of mediate this aggressive, uh, uh, disruptive public realm. Now, for a lot of people, that isn't, a lot of landscape architects, that's just simply not a very interesting uh, uh, project to work on, uh, decorating other people's buildings and, and, and softening and making more friendly the, the public realm. And also, people looked around and said, you know, what the problems that cities really have to deal with don't have to do with decorating plazas so much as they have to do with dealing with sites like this. So a uh, number of people started thinking about tools, ways of working, and a kind of ambition to work at a large scale on the city and on the landscape. And the thinking about landscape urbanism arises from an insight that these two photographs uh, Photograph at the top is a photograph by Alan McLean. The photograph on the bottom is uh, Gersky's photograph of uh, Los Angeles at night. That both of these images, the, the urban and the landscape images, uh, have a lot in common. In both instances, you have a kind of embedded structure in the landscape that organizes the performance of that particular landscape, whether it's a landscape a natural landscape or an urban landscape. Uh, and also an intuition that the problems of the American city, and in particular cities like Los Angeles, spread out open fields linked together by infrastructural elements that are porous to nature and porous to landscape, uh, represented a new kind of city that the tools of landscape urbanism were particularly well suited to deal with. The other intuition was that these two images could, could be considered uh, similar in many ways. Uh, the networks and systems of, uh, let's say, something like a highway infrastructure, uh, channeling, linking up uh, systems of, of, of energy and flow, and the same kinds of systems uh, present in, uh, in the natural world. So, Part of the intuition of landscape urbanism was a shift to systems of movement and flow and supply and indeed towards infrastructure. Uh, so we could say that there are sort of five working variables in landscape urbanism. First of all, this ambition to work at the large scale, to work at the infrastructural scale. Uh, to see the landscape as a kind of infrastructure based on questions of service, supply, and flow. Um, the traditional expertise that belongs to landscape, uh, that is to say, work on surface and pattern. Um, landscape architects, if they were anything, were experts on surface. And thirdly, this uh, idea that landscape 
architecture, landscape, urbanism presented a particular way to think about program and event. Uh, that is to say, again, the sort of extended horizontal plane on which uh, program unfolds. Perhaps the most important insight, I think, from landscape uh, architecture that informs urbanism and landscape urbanism is an attention to process and change that cities are always changing, always evolving, and instead of working towards a kind of predetermined master plan condition, you can really steer that process of change and evolution in a kind of directed way uh, towards uh, some uh, outcome, but that outcome will never be known with certainty uh, in the beginning. And then finally, of course, when you talk about um, uh, landscape architecture, you're necessarily talking about the problem of the natural and the artificial. So in a series of projects done in collaboration with Jim Corner from 1999 till 2003, uh, we worked on a number of these issues. This was the first project we did together, the uh, Downsview Park in uh, Toronto, where right from the beginning our focus was uh, regional, and in particular the relationship of the park to these two uh, large uh, river systems. Uh, similar concerns in a uh, study that we did for the uh, Delaware River uh, waterfront in Philadelphia. That attention to surface and the way in which by shaping the surface, uh, this is one of the Downsview study models, by shaping the surface you can begin to introduce difference into a landscape that had previously been undifferentiated. And the way in which different kinds of patterns um, can suggest different identities and different futures for a site. Uh, these were studies done very early on uh, for the Botanical Garden for the University of Puerto Rico in San Juan. Um, the notion that you can kind of form and direct program by shaping the landscape was a very important idea in the uh, CMC project in uh, Taichung that uh, was done shortly uh, at, towards the end of that period actually, where we wanted to uh, get away from the kind of single focus of the conventional outdoor amphitheater to create a kind of multiple event landscape. Now, again, landscape architects are experts on surface. They're also experts on change. Uh, they, for a landscape architect, the project is not finished uh, at the time uh, that the contractors leave. Uh, it's in, in, in the most uh, ordinary sense, it's a question of the landscape growing into uh, maturity. But even, even the most conventional landscape has to be maintained in a kind of steady state. Uh, and what's more interesting today is the way in which landscape architects are thinking about evolution and change and succession on a site and really making that process of interaction with the natural elements thematic to the site so that you can, you can talk today not about a kind of quantitative change where a landscape simply grows into maturity, but you can talk about qualitative changes uh, over time. This was one of the early working diagrams, for example, for the Fresh Gills project that Jim and I did in 2001. Um, and it was the notion, Fresh Gills is the landfill for uh, all, all five boroughs of New York City, and we had the problem of dealing with these very undifferentiated uh, mounds that, that had accumulated trash over so many years. People used to like to say that they'd been contributing to our project for years. Um, and one of the things we realized is that on the north and the east slopes, because there was less sunlight incident on the slopes, uh, that there was significantly wetter uh, growing environment on those slopes. So by seeding the mounds with different plant species, where we could loosely determine a kind of difference from uh, the, the south and the west facing slopes, over time we would create a very strong difference and a very strong uh, identity um, by really working with the conditions that were there on site and then pushing them uh, further. Another example from Downs View, um, anyone who's worked on a large scale site knows one of the problems is always um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, runoff and retention. 
if you talk to an engineer, their solution is to, to um, give you retention ponds. They'll tell you how big they have to be and where they have to go. And retention ponds are nice enough. They give you some water and they can be kind of picturesque, but they didn't really seem very interesting to us. And they also didn't seem to work with the kind of notion of a kind of continuous program that we were interested in. So uh, we devised this kind of uh, constructed topography that would alternate wet with dry uh, conditions. And we proposed a series of these, what we called habitat nests, uh, throughout the site. And what's interesting about these nests is that they function perfectly well. They were checked with the uh, hydrological engineers to retain water on site. In fact, because the plant, uh, uh, because uh, they tended to encourage more plant growth, they were actually even more effective at controlling uh, runoff and erosion than a conventional uh, retention pond. But what's interesting is depending on where they were, over time they would again take on different identities. Uh, so, for example, the tall grass prairies that were sort of upland, that, that got less water, would take on a completely different character, completely different spatiality over time uh, as a result of the way in which uh, the same form interacted with the environment uh, over time. So there's a kind of notion that you see the site with potential early on, and then through a kind of uh, adaptive management, you can produce this difference over time. You can begin to define uh, the specifics and the quality and the characteristics of the site uh, over time. Now, this last point, again, about, always about dealing with the artificial and the natural. Now, one of the things we know, again, even from the history of landscape architecture, is uh, that a supposedly pastoral and naturalistic landscape like Central Park uh, is, in fact, the result of some very serious infrastructural and engineering work, as shown on the left. This is actually, this is Prospect Park, but the image on the left is uh, the construction of, uh, of Central Park. Now, uh, there was a thinking in the 80s, I think, uh, mostly, that somehow the job of uh, landscape architecture, the job, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, the Shumi and Lavillette, uh, Shumi and Kohlhaas projects for Lavillette, um, you, you, you needed to sort of declare the artificiality of nature in a very, very explicit way. In other words, really to see nature through the lens of culture, to see nature through the lens of uh, architecture. What I would suggest today is that we're very often, uh, we've, we've turned that perspective around and that we're seeing uh, nature, so we're seeing architecture, we're seeing culture more and more through the lens of nature. And we're doing that in part because of thinking about information, thinking about the role of information in uh, biology. Uh, I always love this, uh, this image, it's actually from Doxiades, but uh, that's the spider on speed on the right there. And basically what's happening is uh, the, the information that the spider uses to construct the web has been uh, messed with. So uh, that notion that biology is actually a, uh, a field that's all about information has allowed us to think about nature in different ways and turn that old sort of artificial natural uh, equation around a little bit. Now, the last point that I want to make, uh, again, uh, I think, I think the, the, that very quick summary, in a way, um, uh, outlines some of the areas in which I think architects and, and, and urban designers can learn from uh, landscape. Uh, but again, in that spirit of a certain skepticism, um, if we think about some of the cities uh, around the globe, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, and the, the kind of brutality and the density, the speed with which they're being uh, constructed, um, one of the problems is that the tools of landscape uh, are not tough enough in a way to deal with uh, this kind of, kind of construction. So, uh, there's, there are very valuable lessons to be learned from uh, landscape urbanism, but it's also, I think, important to recognize a kind of limit, kind of end point, um, that in fact really requires 
thinking again about architecture, about density, about verticality, about a lot of those things that, that landscape urbanism and landscape architecture uh, had pushed to the side uh, momentarily. Now, it did occur to me that uh, immediately before this period when, when Jim Corner and I collaborated, I published a book called Points and Lines that, that looked at uh, tactics for dealing with urban sites. And it looked at tactics for dealing with urban sites under three different categories, contextual tactics, infrastructural urbanism, field conditions. And um, interestingly enough, it uh, occurred to me that the three major projects that we've completed recently that work within the larger territory of landscape urbanism also continue to develop ideas uh, that were put forward uh, now 10 years ago before that engagement with landscape urbanism. So the first project I'm going to show falls, and again, these categories are, of course, overlapping. Uh, there are elements of infrastructure in the project I'm about to show. Um, there are contextual tactics in the other projects. Um, but the first project I'm going to show is um, also for the city of Taichung in uh, Taiwan. Uh, we were asked to look at uh, this site uh, now about um, two and a half years ago. Uh, we're, we're coming to the end of a master planning process and the plan, in fact, is being sort of written into legislation as we speak. Um, this is the aerial view of the city of Taichung. Taichung is about um, an hour south of Taipei by high-speed rail. Uh, the high-speed rail comes down here. In fact, that was the site of the study that we did for the CMC. Uh, this is the center, uh, historic center of um, Taichung. The city grew out in a kind of radial way. It was constrained by the mountains on this side. And this was the municipal airport of uh, Taichung. Uh, at the time it was built, it was outside of the city. Clearly the city has grown up around it. New airport has been built further out. And uh, that has left a uh, 240 hectare, that's close to 600 acres, uh, completely empty tabula rasa site, uh, quite close to the center of town. So it's an incredible opportunity, but also presents some very serious uh, issues. Of course, the site, as it stands now, has absolutely no identity at all. It's completely undifferentiated. There's about one meter of level change across the whole uh, length of the site. And of course, it's been cut off from the rest of the city for the last uh, 40 years. So we started looking at this site, first of all, from the point of view of natural systems, how we could link it back to the local ecologies. But also, because of the necessity and its length and the necessity of traveling through it, uh, the architectural tradition of linear uh, cities. So this shows a little more clearly in diagrammatic form. This is the historic core of the city planned by the Japanese. Uh, this is a new civic center where a number of buildings, are, including the uh, Toyo Ito Opera House, are, are being built. This is the road to the new airport, and you see the way it needs to go through the site and connect into the existing system of uh, radial roads uh, in the city. But then also, because of a river system, uh, there is an opportunity to pull the green space into the city by the means of this uh, project. So uh, this was our first proposal, where we simply took that road, put the necessity of the road with its, in our view, over designed 60 meter uh, right of way and created a series of sweeping curves that would then map out a series of green open spaces and then uh, simply let the city grow into that new figure. Now in part that was based also on a kind of realism about what the city could actually control. The city could control open space and the city, city can control infrastructure. The city can't really control the, 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 the fabric uh, as it gets built over time. Necessarily, that's going to get built by developers and other architects and, and uh, so on. So the other point from the beginning about the project is that this middle piece would have a very high degree of design, a very high degree of control, and there would be other tools used uh, to map out the, the city fabric around. Also, again, that notion of change and uncertainty, we didn't know the future uh, of this particular site, how densely built out it would be ultimately, 
And uh, the point of this drawing is that with the exact same configuration, you can make a completely green open space or you can, you can populate it with commercial buildings uh, without essentially changing the structure of the project. Now, these little anecdotes you tell in the course of a project, we showed this to the mayor. Uh, the mayor uh, loved the project, but he hated the road. He said, I didn't promise the people of Haichung a road, I promised them a park. So we had to, we had to devise a new uh, narrative. Uh, we thought the fundamental strategy was strong, but we had to devise a new narrative. So um, the road, uh, instead of defining the park, now uh, goes in and out of the city fabric. Uh, and then the form of the park itself is actually derived from an overall site water management uh, strategy uh, where the catchment basins begin to provide a kind of geometry. Uh, and in fact, there are canals on site that, that are going to be uh, recovered and uh, daylight. So here's, here's the, uh, the figure of the plan that's actually being uh, implemented. And you can see it works with this strategy of the void, the big void figure that gives this district its new identity and is developed to a high level of detail as a public space. And then uh, the, the, uh, we wanted to erase the old boundary of the airport and let the city fabric grow up and create that uh, figure. Now, of course, there's a third element, which is these large-scale uh, architectural pieces that define the kind of gateway condition at the north, uh, which you see here. And again, we worked uh, very carefully to try and uh, integrate those buildings into the larger sort of infrastructural and landscape uh, strategies. Um, that green space itself is densely layered, densely programmed, uh, and here you can see again the way in the kind of aerial view, here's the roadway coming through, through the city fabric, through the park, and then back through uh, the city fabric. The roadway itself, of course, is studied and designed. But then uh, the figure of the park uh, creates uh, several distinct uh, neighborhoods. Uh, there's an existing university here. There's a proposal for the Chinese Medical College to relocate here. This is to be a residential district. This is to be a lower density residential district. And this is the kind of gateway condition. But again, the point here, in these areas, we can't design with a high level of precision. We can only steer things, hence this sort of analogy of the kind of heat map. Uh, and we used more conventional tools. Uh, we studied a lot of the traditional architecture of the local blocks, uh, kind of typologies, sampling, and even the more conventional tools of, um, of zoning maps, FARs, and so on, uh, anticipating that over time, some kind of mixed-use neighborhood uh, would emerge. Now, with these pieces, which are more at the level of infrastructure, more at the level of large-scale uh, civic pieces, we did have a higher level of control. Um, we, and again, we really wanted to integrate the city with the park here. Uh, yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. Uh, transit hub and uh, travel hotel here, a large convention center piece mixed-use office tower and a small uh, covered stadium and shopping and a hotel here. So uh, one of the points here is that these three towers, because you're adjacent to the ring road, as you move around, the three towers will change their relationship to one another as you move. So this is the, this is the concourse level plan. You can see basically the open space of the convention center. Uh, the bus drop-offs in the transit hub, small covered stadium, shopping concourse, and the lobbies for the hotels. Uh, and then uh, the park slips through underneath the raised body of the convention center, uh, and there's a large uh, concourse of service and parking beneath the whole thing. Um, in a building like this, for example, the reflected ceiling plan is almost more important than the plan because from the park, that's the primary facade to the building. So this is the view from the ring road. Again, as you're moving in the car, these three towers would change their uh, relationship to one another. 
Again, that attention to change over time and the evolution of the project, the life of the project in time, everything comes with a kind of phasing strategy, but not a, not a conventional linear phasing strategy. It's a notion that there are three threads, ecology, infrastructure, and program, and the three of them are interrelated. Now, of course, the first step is usually demolition, but we could start with an empty site, so the first operation would be the carving out of this kind of eco uh, reserve, then the water restoration and the road infrastructure, and then you have the pioneers, uh, the either private development uh, in the uh, choice sites here, or public development in terms of these uh, major civic buildings and the, the role that the cultural institutions, again, would play early on in the project. And then people begin to follow, and then over time, the project has an effect beyond its boundaries uh, as it's built up. And again, as the old boundary of the airport disappears, and the figure, the icon of the, of the uh, park becomes the kind of defining uh, uh, identity for this new site. All right, well, the second of these categories, again, nine years ago, 10 years ago, that I worked with was this notion of infrastructural uh, urbanism. And um, we had an opportunity to, to, to sort of think about these issues and to work uh, with these issues in a design study that we did this summer. Basically, because of the recent election in Taiwan, our contacts in Taichung moved up to Taipei, and we were invited to take a look at this particular site in uh, Taipei. Um, this is one kilometer from here to here. Um, there's a kind of axis that runs this way. The 101 tower is up here. The central train station is here. And this is being developed partly as commercial, partly as green. And we were asked to take a look at this waterfront site where this axis would terminate. And also this little piece here where there was an existing uh, parking garage uh, uh, now pretty much obsolete, built in the 1970s. Now, we didn't bring infrastructure to this project as a theme from the outside. In fact, uh, the site was all about infrastructure. Um, the, this bridge and all the spaghetti off-ramps, uh, which you see here, and then this guy. Um, we were being asked to design a park on this side of this 8.6 meter high flood control wall. Uh, Taipei is subject to flooding uh, because of the typhoons, and in the 1970s, this 8.6 meter high concrete wall was, uh, was erected. So one of the things we knew very early on is we couldn't do anything about the park without thinking about the nature of this, uh, this wall. Uh, you know, I don't need to tell you that the, the wall's a problem. It's pretty obvious from this image. Um, limits access, it blocks the views. And, and as a result, uh, the kinds of things that have been pushed to the other side of the wall are both from an ecological point of view and a programmatic point of view, they're completely degraded. Now, uh, as we work, we're always looking for one move that can, can solve many problems at the same time. And in this particular uh, instance, it was this insight um, that we could maintain a similar level of flood protection, uh, the 8.6 meter flood height, with an earthen levee, um, but that instead of creating a boundary between the city and the waterfront, it would allow smooth uh, movement up into the park. It would also allow um, a, a diversification of program, it created opportunities for different kinds of landscaping. Uh, so with this one shift from the wall to the levee, we could open up a whole series of new potentials uh, for, for the site. Um, and, uh, we, and we could begin to push that wall in and out, uh, as you can see here in this aerial photograph where we pull the water right up to the city in some places, and then we push this green space back out. Uh, there's another here issue here, which is important, um, which is that outboard of the wall, because it's subject to flooding, we can only use hardscape. Uh, we can't really put any significant plant materials. 
So again, if we're to create any kind of development of the landscape itself, um, you have to push the flood protection out further so that you can create green areas like this. This is one exception to that where we use uh, native wetland plants which, which can survive the flooding. So, so the, the, the point here is that, that suddenly with the move from the wall to the levee, a whole series of, of uh, different uh, potentials are opened up, both in plan and in uh, section. So the operation is to take that existing wall, uh, cut it, shape the shoreline. We maintained the square footage of the site. We pushed out further in some places and pulled the water in in others. But then we lengthened the shoreline and we lengthened uh, the wall itself. So we improved the ecologies, we improved the programs, um, and uh, we allow a kind of a simple, smooth access to uh, the site. And by shaping the topography, we create this potential of a kind of elevated walkway uh, that was not available uh, before. So uh, it becomes possible now to traverse the site at an elevated level, moving in and out, uh, as you can see here in this, uh, this last image. So um, these, again, are the layers of that uh, site plan. Um, the circulation path at the crest of the levee, the soft landscape that's now protected from flooding, the hard boardwalk landscape that's outboard of the wall that has to be flooded periodically, and then a series of built structures that are either embedded in the, in the wall itself or, in the case of this building, uh, erected on the site of that existing uh, parking garage. So uh, these are just those layers, the, the three circulation systems, the continuous boardwalk at the water's edge, the elevated pathway, and then a very more intricate series of pathways to move around. Um, we had to relocate all the parking that had previously been on site as well as what had been contained in that parking garage. So by distributing it into two parking structures, we're, we're able to get the coverage that we need for that uh, parking and we can we can really diversify uh, the programs on site as a result so uh, this is then the final uh, site plan you can see the the wall is moving like this and then it hooks up into this building here comes back out one small <coughs> bunch there and this is the more of the kind of wetland zones uh, there. Looking at some of these a little bit more detail, this is where we've embedded the uh, parking garage uh, in the, the, uh, the height of the, uh, the levee itself, taking advantage of that as a kind of built structure. Uh, here is the large amphitheater uh, at the base of that uh, new uh, corridor. Uh, and then uh, at, the, at the south end, on the site of the uh, parking garage, uh, we're proposing a kind of iconic uh, uh, building that, that will serve to, again, to, to, to give this site a new identity, and again, to create a relationship between uh, landscape architecture and architecture here. So this building is thought of as taking that wall and then just wrapping it up along itself um, to create uh, this, the structure above the parking garage. So the plinth, as a kind of infrastructural plinth that takes care of all of the parking, um, that uh, maintains the same height as the wall with a park on top, and then above that, um, we wrap this around and uh, we started we, we started looking for programs that could um, give us the, the, the sufficient uh, area to, to create a kind of iconic presence at this end of the site. And of course, the first obvious thing you add back is, uh, is commercial space. Um, but that, for us, didn't serve to connect thematically back to uh, the park itself. Uh, so we're proposing a series of programs that are linked with uh, environment, environmental education, and the natural landscape. Um, specifically, although it's probably not, literally not going to fly, this rather fanciful idea that we proposed initially of an aquarium, um, but here within the netted structure, the notion of introducing an aviary. Um, we are actually 
beginning to develop this building uh, beyond these sort of sort of placeholder uh, images, um, with the notion that uh, we can probably maintain uh, an environmental education center in addition to the shopping uh, and uh, hang on to the aviary as an important program uh, necessary not only to create a kind of iconic presence at the southern end of the site, but, but really to tie the building back not only at the level of the structure of the bridges, but to tie the building back uh, thematically to the presence of this landscape just adjacent. All right. So the third of these three categories, again, revisiting uh, a category first proposed in 1996, this notion of field conditions. Uh, this image here is a herd of bison reacting to the presence of a helicopter. And you can see they've actually kind of mimicked the, the rotation of the rotors. Um, this is actually, more strictly speaking, a landscape project, although I think you'll see our response is not, um, strictly speaking, landscape. We were invited as one of uh, four international teams um, to make a proposal. This was an invited competition for uh, the uh, Guangzhou Lakeside Park, uh, which you see here. Uh, the site consisted of these two reservoirs, two man-made reservoirs. Um, in some sense, quite nice, although rather un undistinguished. Um, uh, but the, the real dilemma of the competition was that th there was no real definition of this park. Um, you, you have the presence of the two reservoirs, but certainly if we hadn't superimposed this yellow boundary, you couldn't find the site. So the site wasn't defined architecturally, and it wasn't defined um, on the basis of natural features. So part of the, for, for us, uh, part of the real challenge of this particular project and the motivation behind our solution was to create some form of new identity for this site without relying on the conventional uh, ways in which landscape has been defined. Mostly landscape is defined as the absence of architecture. Now, this becomes uh, particularly difficult when you see what, what's proposed for this site, right? That this site, which uh, actually it's, uh, this photograph is, is maybe six months old, they're, they're beginning to clear the land uh, for this major commercial development. Who knows what's going to happen with the, uh, with the recession? But again, I think you can see here that in the presence of such large-scale, pretty banal, commercial architectural development, conventional landscape doesn't have a chance. So it required something more radical. So instead of falling back on the traditional definition of landscape as the absence of architecture, as a void within the city, that's the, the Olmsted, what was so powerful at Central Park uh, in the 19th century, we wanted to revisit this iconic image, the, the famous collage of Hans Holein's uh, aircraft carrier in the landscape. And if in the 1960s that was a kind of icon about, the, about somehow technology working as an imposition on the landscape, we thought in the 21st century, 50 years later, that could get repurposed to think about a new kind of landscape infrastructure that was a strong presence on the landscape, but it was working more with the natural uh, environment. So these are some of the earlier studies, but uh, one of the things that we arrived at very early was a notion that we would connect the site end to end, spanning both legs uh, with some form of landscape infrastructure but then that landscape infrastructure would be integrated with uh, the landscape uh, itself. So we wanted to make this very systematic in a way um, and very didactic. This notion that in order to deal with this difficult site, there are five steps. First of all, you consolidate everything. You take all of the active programs on site and you consolidate them in this single peer-like landscape infrastructure that connects end-to-end -end the site. So that all the movement, all the circulation, all the active programs concentrated in one band. 
And our argument is, even though that may look like a larger imposition on the site and look anti-ecological, in fact, it protects the site because it consolidates the active programs in one area, allowing those ecologies to reconnect, to extend uh, outward from the site. Because this is what ecologies do. Ecologies don't respect boundaries. Ecologies are always about crossing categories, crossing boundaries. So the first move is to consolidate. The second move is to extend and dissolve the boundaries. So the basic vocabulary of the project is the peer and the fields. And the peer and the fields are given equal weight. Third is within that strip, you have to curate the program and embrace change. So uh, we had a very kind of conscious uh, thinking about what kinds of programs work and uh, the idea, again, a successful park is an active park. But we also had to revitalize uh, the ecologies and we worked very closely with uh, Shane Cohen partners uh, to develop a kind of ecological strategy to restore and renew uh, the existing uh, landscapes and then to supplement them with, with an additional uh, landscape proposal. So this is a view looking from the south towards the north. Um, this lake here is intended to be more active and uh, here you can see our pier structure, the landscape infrastructure that uh, allows you to travel from end to end from the site, but it adapts to the specific conditions of the landscape uh, along the way. And then you see the way in which uh, the landscape, the field vocabulary, works its way through and under and uh, interacts with uh, the project as it goes along. Fifth point, though, is if you're making such a large construction on the landscape, you can consider it in the traditional way. You really have to think of it as a kind of biomechanical machine that is actually not taking energy uh, from the site. It's, it's actually uh, doing, doing ecological work on site. And so, in fact, this particular moment of the project here, the spillway of the northern lake, uh, and then there's also a highway coming underneath here. So all of these things are coming together. The air is being filtered, the water is being oxygenated in the spillway, and then filtered, and then pumped and fed by gravity into uh, the orchard paddocks here. So the idea that the, the, the architecture is not an imposition of the landscape, it's actually doing landscape work. So just to take you quickly through the project, this is the southern lake. And this is where the bulk of the commercial development will occur. So this, this piece, this bridge-like piece, and the artificial wetlands bring you into uh, the, the, the pier. And then you can start this movement in this direction. This is a view of that pier. And this is you know, anticipated to be uh, quite active day and night uh, and uh, with a view to the hotel piece uh, over there, which is located here. Uh, and in this zone, uh, the major cultural uh, programs are located, but you can also see the way in which, from this, again, elevated viewpoint, uh, and you, you get uh, new perspectives out over the landscape, looking back towards the housing piece, um, but also shaping and forming that landscape. Um, uh, so that it, 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 it too can be very active and uh, highly programmed. Um, this is the, the center portion where the, the topography drops down and we create these systems of canals and orchards. And here, as the, the pier bridges over, we worked with this very lightweight shell structure that, that would allow uh, the thing to become a kind of bridge that you could easily walk under. Here is the aeration spillway in the bio building where this water and uh, the, the exhaust from the highway are, are filtered. And then we're moving uh, by way of the spillway that overlooks the northern lake into this calmer, uh, more naturalistic environment um, where you have uh, the sort of reed forest here uh, kayaks, boating, environmental education. Uh, that was a little karaoke pavilion, uh, very important. Pathway up to a kind of research lodge and hotel at the 
top of that hill. And here at the northern end of the site, again, this was another very large site, uh, close, to, close to 600 acres. Um, the architecture is making a very light imposition on the site and allowing for uh, passive recreation, quiet uh, uses of the landscape, such as uh, uh, bird walk, watching, and so on. So each of these systems has a kind of internal complexity um, the, that, that, that goes from its relationship to the water, uh, through the landscape surfaces, the buildings, and the pathways. Uh, and then again, a kind of equal complexity to uh, the landscape uh, itself. Uh, there were existing forests on site which get stabilized and preserved. Um, the water infrastructure is uh, extensively reinforced, new understory planting, and then these two, uh, actually these three levels that are highly structured uh, plantings. So there are moments in which the architecture very much recedes to be, be framed by the landscape. Uh, and then there are moments in which the, the, the architecture is more forward. Now, so far I've been explaining the project very much in terms of this binary logic of peers and uh, fields. And I think it's important to say though that, you know, as an ecology, it's gonna work together. And that's where these three systems of movement, culture, and ecology uh, come together, and each one seen in relationship to the water, the fields, and the pier. So the uh, water taxis and the active recreation, a, a, a network of very low impact uh, pathways through the fields, and then the linear concentration of movement on the pier. Again, uh, a kind of thematic related to the water having to do with research, a thematic related to the fields, having to do with uh, ecology and the environment, and then uh, the pier itself uh, programmed for uh, cultural activities. And then the water ecologies that have to do um, with the shoreline environments, the more extended field ecologies, and then finally the, the, the productive ecologies of the pier itself. Now, again, all of these projects have to be imagined over time, and um, the, the first operation in this case, in fact, is the stabilization, preservation of the existing forests. So the first constructions would be small, more or less linear insertions um, that would, would allow early access and high visibility. And then the second phase has to do with the more structured landscape uh, plantings, uh, the nurseries, the, the orchards, and the bosques. Um, the fourth phase has to do with operating on two levels, again, on the architecture and on the water ecologies, to really complete all of the circuits and the loops. Uh, it was interesting because the phasing diagrams were done later, but the phasing diagrams themselves show a certain degree of the structure of the project that's not necessarily visible when all the layers are there uh, together. And then finally, to focus again a little bit more on some of the architectural pieces, I've already talked a little bit about this aeration spillway that's located here, uh, the way in which it frames uh, the water, but also performs uh, the work of uh, filtering uh, the water either through soft filters or hard filters. This is the zone of the project uh, where it's most densely programmed and populated, primarily with cultural uh, programs, uh, particularly here as a kind of interpretive center and community center, uh, and then um, cultural programs in, in the thickness of the pier itself there. This is the shell construction as it bridges over the uh, orchards, creating here, uh, through the use of, of soil stabilization, also a kind of stepped amphitheater. And then finally here, part of the program called for 600 units of housing. And one of our arguments is that we, we integrated the housing into uh, this larger structure, creating a kind of southern terminus uh, for the pier uh, at, the, at the very far end as you bridge across uh, this great sort of sloping lawn, um, uh, both uh, terminates the, 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 the pier structure, also because the topography rises here, uh, but it allows us to accommodate 
a large um, uh, building for housing purposes completely within the logic of the project and not as a kind of, a kind of uh, imposition uh, from the outside. So zooming, zooming back out there again, uh, you see the entire length of the pier structure, uh, the, the Sindai Lake um, at the north, Wanchon Lake at the south, uh, but again, the way in which the project is really premised on a kind of uh, productive interaction between an architectural presence and the landscape presence without giving either one of them uh, weight over the other. So it, it, it's really looking towards a kind of, kind of synthesis of uh, architecture and uh, landscape. All right, well. I'm going to close out uh, by showing a few uh, projects that have recently been built or are uh, either close to starting construction or under construction. And so, in a way, we sort of go from the largest thing we've done recently to the smallest thing we've done recently. Um, this is a small addition completed in uh, Eastern Long Island, which I show uh, primarily to um, contextualize this project that, that there's a series of three houses here where we were we were very interested in the section and the kind of active roof line uh, of the park this is a this is a project that uh, Eric Owen Moss knows quite well um, is one of 32 houses commissioned by a developer for Eastern Long Island and I think there have been about six built this this pro this house was finished uh, uh, last year um, in the original letter that we received, there was this funny line that said something like um, uh, more or less traditional roof lines, which we read as a, um, a code word for no flat roofs. Um, we were also kind of interested in what that might mean. Um, also, because the sites were relatively small, it tended to focus uh, attention on the house as a kind of, as a kind of vertical figure on the landscape, again, as opposed to something, surfaces that, let's say, were folded up uh, to create the house. So, uh, so we were interested in the house itself as an icon, and uh, of course we were interested then in the sectional potential that that would give us as the volume of the house became more compressed and hence extended in the, in the vertical uh, dimension. Um, and again, the, the initial letter did ask us to make some reference to local vernaculars. I think we're probably the only ones who did that, but uh, certainly some of the, uh, the, 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 the history of Eastern Long Island, both in the sort of longer sense, but also the, the experiments done by uh, people like Richard Meyer and Charlie Wathby in the, in the 60s, I think, were certainly figured very much uh, in our mind when we were uh, working on this, uh, this house. Um, so, you see here the, the, the verticality of that uh, central space, uh, the, the, the pretty small space in plan uh, with a kind of gal gallery around it and a kind of layering of that uh, space away from the public spaces here towards the more private spaces uh, behind, uh, the quality of light coming in from above, uh, again the verticality uh, there and the expression of the uh, structure in those uh, skylights. Um, little bridge piece to uh, the studio piece here and then a view uh, from the pool side at night where you see uh, if, if the side that faces the street is very, very austere, very, very closed here, uh, things open up in, in relationship to this small uh, kind of terrace. Um, that notion of a very active roof line and working with the, the kind of iconic profile of the house led directly into this house that, that was, uh, was actually designed at the time that the Sagaponic house was under construction. Um, this is an a, a oceanfront house uh, in the Philippines, uh, should be starting construction uh, quite soon, and as you can see, the site slopes quite steeply. So the operation of the house is, on the one hand, to build a kind of artificial landscape uh, that creates a mid-level living area that's very open, which the, the differences between inside and outside are minimized, and then to float the volume of the, of the four bedrooms with their articulated uh, profile above. So the house is entered from above here, and you make your way down to this mid-level mid living area, but always conscious of the profile 
of these um, uh, these skylights, which are also oriented as wind scoops. Um, it's reinforced concrete house and then has a kind of windscreen of uh, local wood. Uh, again, this is making reference to some of the uh, local building traditions, but, but with a completely modern uh, material. So here you, see, you enter from here. Uh, this is that major living level, and then you see uh, these uh, figures in section here, and is the view of the house essentially from uh, the roadway uh, where these, um, uh, these three uh, light wells, wind scoops, really create uh, the iconic presence of the house uh, and frame the view to the ocean uh, beyond. Um, this is a slightly larger project, about uh, 20,000 square feet, um, bigger than a house, but um, small as a building goes. It's, it, uh, it's for a, a publishing house. Um, this is located um, about uh, 30 miles, um, 30 kilometers north of Seoul, uh, Paju Book City. Paju Book City is a new city uh, designed to house uh, publishing industries in Korea. And uh, this was the original master plan model. Our site is located right here. And the typology that's proposed for these areas is called the uh, bookshelf uh, typology. Um, it's an interesting story about this project. I first visited this site in, uh, I think in 2000 or 2001. And it looked a lot like this. They were beginning to construct the roadways. There was absolutely nothing there. Uh, we were given a site, a client, and a, and a commission. Uh, we worked on it for about um, nine months. We presented the design, the client sold her business, the project was put on hold for six years. Um, I came back, was given a different site, a different client, and in those six years there were 165 buildings built on the site. Um, so we certainly approached the project differently uh, with that um, uh, benefit of, of having seen what, what happened in that, those uh, six years. There's a little bit of a shock here. Um, let's see if I can orient myself. Um, I think, um, our site is here. Um, that's a building by Halim Su. Young Ho Chang has a building here. Uh, people like FOA and, and Sejima uh, built buildings here. So there was an interesting mixture of younger Korean architects and, um, and invited foreign architects. So these are some of our early studies. This is, these are the requirements of the bookshelf typology, which is essentially that no more than 50% of the building uh, can go up above the two-story level, and you have to maintain these uh, east-west uh, view corridors. Um, so this is the logic of the, the uh, massing of that particular uh, version, where first of all we have to reduce to the required uh, footprint, uh, create the setbacks and the view corridors, and then the kind of articulation. So it's a very simple, it's, it's, it's a very modernist way of working on a building. Um, again, part of the lesson of that uh, uh, 165 buildings in six years is that uh, we wanted to be different by being, uh, in a sense, quieter and simpler than everything that was uh, around us. Uh, so the building has a uh, very simple uh, cubic massing. Again, um, it's basically an office building for a publishing company. Um, and uh, we pushed all of the circulation to the perimeter of the building and then uh, the, the curtain wall peels away as the stairs go up and leaves a kind of rough uh, concrete uh, visible on the uh, uh, perimeter. Uh, this is the ground floor plan. You, you, ent you enter either from the park. The other thing we did was to, was to push away from the sort of standard uh, full site coverage to create a kind of L shape that would create a kind of uh, uh, courtyard space here. Uh, so you enter either from the parking here or from the street here. Both of those routes come together here uh, at the center where there's, uh, you can begin to see here, here you see the stairs pushed to the outside, uh, the, the curtain wall beginning to be put over the concrete structure. Here at the front, again, you see these stairs as they make their way up along the outside. Uh, 
Creek, and then this slot here that carries up all the way through to bring light down. So below those three circular entries is the, circular skylights is the entry. And uh, one of the pleasures of working in a place like Korea is the, the, the ability to, to get very, pretty high quality uh, board form concrete that we can, uh, will, will, will be left visible in, in all of these uh, stairs. And then, um, if the massing of the building becomes very simple, then a lot of the, the uh, expression of the building gets, in a sense, sort of displaced to the skin itself. And we're, we're working now on, a, on uh, a series of ways of treating that, that skin um, with a uh, frit pattern uh, that, that simulates, uh, it's actually derived from uh, curtain, uh, this is the this is the sample of the frit pattern. So the the frit pattern will be continuous around the outside of the building, and then just inside the curtain wall, you can see here the mock-up of these uh, sliding uh, metal panels that will have uh, colored glass uh, fitted into these panels um, behind that uh, curtain wall. So um, this was an earlier color study. Um, not quite so muddy on my screen, trust me. Um, we are tending, uh, these, we're tending towards the blue greens and the yellows, but uh, we're not in, colors are a little brighter on my screen. Um, but again, the notion here is that there's one very simple organizational move, which is pushing all of the circulation to the outside and creating this sort of slot of space. Um, and then the simple, simple volumetric forms, but then the work on the surface itself that will give the building uh, a kind of particular identity within this, uh, this um, somewhat debased uh, landscape of uh, new buildings. All right, well, the last project um, was finished um, just under a year ago, uh, also in the Philippines, and it's this uh, small chapel that we were uh, asked to do. Um, we were commissioned by this organization, which uh, has a small campus, uh, which is located over here. Um, and they're a, a charitable organization that takes care of handicapped children. And this was previously a parking lot. And they came to us and said, we don't have a lot of money. We can't pay your fee, but we'll build whatever you draw. And we couldn't resist that. Um, so this, uh, the, the other uh, nice thing about the project is this is the gate to, the, to their campus. So uh, the building really, really functions as a kind of gateway to the campus itself. Uh, the tower uh, is yet to be funded, but the chapel itself is, is complete. Um, the other nice thing about this building, uh, uh, again, the, the, the ability to work very directly with, with reinforced concrete in places like the Philippines and, and, and Korea, this is a building with no mechanical system, it's got no glass in the windows, the, the, the rain and the wind blow right through it, um, and so it, it has this fairly sort of elemental uh, uh, feel, but it also, in a funny way, for me, connects back to the question of landscape, because again, it's not so much separated from the landscape as an enclosed, hermetically sealed uh, building, but it's, it's uh, it, the, the, the surface, as you see in the plan, uh, through these big pivot doors, uh, the, 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 there's really no distinction between interior and ex exterior surfaces. Uh, in this building. So it's basically constructed of a single line that wraps around itself, uh, creates this big opening for the entry, uh, folds back on itself for the vestry, the altar is, is here, and the baptistry is located here. Um, in part, the walls are kinked. Um, not only was the budget very low, it's a, it's a high seismic zone, and of course the Philippines is, is subject to uh, typhoons. So it had to resist these very extreme uh, climactic uh, conditions. So in part, the angles have to do with creating an intrinsic uh, stiffness um, in, in, in the structure. Um, I wouldn't go too far with this, but some people have suggested that it's a bit like arms embracing the, uh, the, the congregation. I think our thinking was really more about modulating the entry and then swelling out to 
frame the altar. But uh, again, you know, that's that's the kind of the, the kind of uh, meanings that, that that architecture takes on over time. Big acacia tree here that had to be preserved. This is a view from the inside. Temporary uh, pews. We are uh, we have designed. Uh, chairs, but those two are, are, are waiting for funding. But you can see it's completely open here, and then we work with the thickness of those walls and the angled slots to bring uh, the light in. Um, now, um, if the angled walls give a certain degree of structural uh, stability, um, we, we, we wanted to keep the uh, exterior quite light. We wanted to keep this verticality of the, of the expressed uh, piers, um, but again, we had to we had to deal with the lateral uh, loads. So what this is showing is that that that, that there are two zones um, where working with the uh, 40 centimeter thickness of the wall, there there is continuity on the inside and continuity on the outside, effectively <coughs> forming two large uh, shear walls. But we do this without an appearance. Of, of, of massiveness. So you can see essentially on the inside, that zone is continuous, and on the exterior, that zone is continuous. But we've been able to do that working with the engineer without creating a sense of massiveness and keeping the, the vertical articulation and the, the, the uh, slots that work within the thickness of the wall as the primary expression on the outside. Uh, another view of that, where all of these angled slots bring in both, uh, both light air. Uh, this is a very typical material, uh, kind of, kind of um, uh, irregular crushed uh, paving that's, that's actually quite typical. This is the, this is the section of the altar uh, where the light is brought in indirectly, again to create a kind of glow behind uh, the altar here. Uh, the light is quite strong. Um, you can't quite see it, but we did paint the angled panels here so that that light uh, takes on different uh, casts. Uh, here, the big pivot doors uh, at the entry, and this uh, very uh, simple, inexpensive, but, but actually quite, quite beautiful paving material that they uh, use there, uh, and the uh, shop that, that, that for me, uh, talks a, a little bit about the way in which this building actually has been uh, quite successfully uh, despite the fact that it looks absolutely nothing like the existing buildings on the campus, it's really become part of the uh, everyday life of this, uh, of this community. So, thank you very much. I'm happy to do questions, if there are any. Hi, Sam, thanks. You know, one of the things that I was excited about uh, landscape urbanism in its early day was that, for me at least, it held uh, the promise of a scenario that would go along the lines of the uh, Hitchcock's The Birds, for example, right? Where, where change would be more measured in terms of speed and right. it was a way to again, rewire the kind of behavioral template yeah. of the city. Yeah. And that it could actually get out of control. Yes. Um, but the more I, I don't know, the more that I think I, I, see, I saw it fall, the more that I started thinking that it might have become too over-reliant on things like plan, um, that it was still obsessed with control, and that it was still about compartmentalizing what was actually something that was far more simpler than I thought, which was you have a huge resource pool that you could, with a very simple move, rewire an entire landscape without having to bath it, you know, regrade it, and all. And it seems like change was not necessarily in terms of speed or growth was never in terms of, again, the lack of control. So could you give, I mean, maybe I was yeah. holding you too close to Chumi's uh, Manhattan transcripts at the time and less with the classical vision of Olmsted, which seems to be what it turned out to be right. more like. Oh, look, look, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, I mean, again, this is part of my sort of motivation that, you know, 10 years is a good time to look back and see what, you know, what has landscape urbanism accomplished and where have they fallen short. And I think exactly, exactly what you described, that was a kind of ambition of landscape urbanism, right? That, that you would, you would see succession and change and evolution in a landscape. And 
And it's absolutely true that, that most of the major projects in landscape urbanism have adhered to a kind of plan-based logic and um, you're, you're not seeing a kind of, a kind of uh, emergent, uh, out-of-control change. I mean, again, I can answer a little bit with, with, with a couple of anecdotes, right? Um, when we did Downs View, right, I mean, Jim and I were the, the sort of dark horses in that competition. Nobody knew who we were. We were up against Shumi and Cole House and FOA. And um, we thought, okay, we had this whole narrative about emergence and nobody else was going to be talking about these things. We, we, we got there. You look at, you look at the, all the entries. Everybody had the word emergent or emergence somewhere in big letters on their boards, except the OMA Bruce Mauer uh, entry, which you could argue was maybe the only entry that actually didn't talk about emergence, it actually practiced, or it promised us or practice a kind of emergence. Now, the flip side of that is my problem with the, with the, 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 the Bruce Mao OMA entry is that it didn't have enough structure. Uh, I mean, one of the things any ecologist will tell you, you don't get emergence unless the initial conditions are defined with some, some level of precision. So, so um, I, I think as a kind of um, theoretical ambition, what you describe is still very much alive. I think what we're looking at is probably more of an institutional failure. That is to say, the people like Jim Corner and Audrey Nguza and others who are now beginning to get uh, com big commissions where they can put some of these ideas into practice, um, are, they're getting commissions essentially for urban parks. And they're tending to work with public agencies that are by their nature quite conservative and highly controlled. So there's a, there's, I, what I would say is there's a kind of mismatch right now between the ambitions of landscape urbanism and the sort of institutional reality of what people are, are, are able to do. Maybe it's going to take another 10 years. I don't know. But uh, I think that's where we are now. Sam, isn't that a function of policy, though? Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. So how do you work with the problem with policy so the landscape can be integrated in a not a decorative way but in a more constructive way? Yeah, well, it, it would it would really require. I mean, you know, again, we're you know, we all have our fingers crossed, right? I mean, it would require inserting uh, designers into that process of thinking about it, about infrastructure uh, and really getting away. Again, this is, I think, uh, part, I mean, uh, look, look. At one level, I think um, landscape urban and landscape architecture was strategically situated to become the kind of host discipline for infrastructure, hydrology, ecology, urbanism, and so on. So the landscape architects were very intelligent that way, right? I mean, to some degree, there was a sort of history of this with, with people like McCarg and so on. Um, but I think, I think landscape architects still struggle against the kind of picturesque and decorative uh, uh, you know, get, getting pigeonholed as, as sort of picturesque and, 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 and decorative. So again, I think there's an opportunity for architects to step up and insert themselves into the process uh, and um, really, really to, to think more about uh, questions of infrastructure and questions of the large scale. Questions. I mean, I mean, the, the, the short answer is, you know, um, whatever intuition it was, you know, more than 20 years ago that led me to Piranesi's Campo Marzio. I mean, uh, uh, the Campo Marzio is this sort of delirious collection of objects, and so I mean, if there's a kind of subtext to this lecture, 
which is, you know, the side of me that's interested in, in landscape and fields on the one hand, and the side of me that's interested in objects and looking for some kind of, some kind of synthesis, some kind of integration, then yeah, that, you know, that's still very much alive. Um, you know, the land art question, I mean, again, it's an interesting one, and, and I think that the problem was a little bit that this was, this was a little bit what landscape architecture was suffering under in the 80s and the 90s, is um, they, were sort of, they were sort of doing a kind of domesticated version of land art. Um, necessarily, you know, because they were working on smaller sites and with, you know, with a limited uh, uh, scope, so that the kind of, you know, the, 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 the I don't know, the power of, of, of uh, land art projects, which is that they're not sort of institutionally bounded and structured and they not kind of, you know, framed by, you know, property and architecture and so on. Uh, they, they sort of tried to do that, but it always ended up being a kind of watered down down version. So, uh, I mean, again, it's it's work that, that I admire, but I, I'm a little skeptical of bringing it directly in, in part because of the kind of um, uh, what, to, to, to my mind, sort of sort of sort of sort of bad experiences of, of landscape architecture in the in the. Um, 80s and 90s. I mean, you know, you, you get a care of a figure like Mary Miss, who who is now doing sort of public art, landscape art. You know, I mean, she's essentially working in many ways like a landscape architecture architect today. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, so it it, 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 it it for me sort of speaks to the kind of domestication of that project. Yeah. First, I want to uh, congratulate you for wearing two shirts at once. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's done it yet. Uh, the other thing, which is, I think, particularly useful for this audience, is that, that your work is what it is and does what it does as you say so. So whether that's in fact so, right. but it's, it's an extremely articulate, I mean, labels and sections and criteria. So assuming there's nothing but genuineness as opposed to disingenuous about it, it, it looks like we know and we can follow the arguments and I think I think that's very much appreciated and and in fact relatively rare. Uh, I had I had one question, which I think is a little bit uh, the residue of, of one of the last ones, which is this. I remember a guy uh, a number of years ago who came from Princeton. His name was Velikovsky, Manuel Velikovsky, who, who represented himself as a cosmologist and was a very controversial guy. And, and the issue really has to do with how conceptually landscape comes to be what it is. And there's, there's a sort of gradualism in your presentation, which from the Velikovsky perspective, Velikovsky right or wrong, but very controversial, was Darwinian landscape, means inch by inch, the Velikovsky landscape was an argument, maybe you know the name, was, was an argument for catastrophism and that the Yucatan got to be the Yucatan because a rock fell and the cliffs of Chile and, and, the, and the fauna of Tasmania and the Galapagos and all of that. In other words, uh, extremes and non sequiturs which, which are colossal in scale and which can never be accounted for in a conventional natural selection process. And particularly when you fly over, so the extremes of landscape, which don't give a kind of equity, because you have a kind of equity policy, quite literally. And the question is whether that precludes some of the most fascinating and in some ways ecological, un unaccountable for aspects of landscape on the Earth. It rules them out. Maybe. Yeah. No. I. I mean. I. It's. It's. A, it's a good. It's an interesting question. Um, and uh, you know, you you think of 
like the work of certain photographers, Emma Gowan, for example, who has photographed these incredible sites that you find in the in the West, you know, the, the mining sites and so on. And uh, I mean, it's I, I guess you know, again, it's it's for me, it's a bit similar to the land art issue, which, which is to say that um, I, I'm not I'm not sure how you could work with that material without domesticating it in, in, in some ways. And in other words, the minute you brought it into the realm of, of uh, you know, a kind of landscape architecture discussion and, you know, again, dealing with all of the sort of problems of um, getting a project through, you know, approval process and so on. I mean, I think, I mean, I think what, what you get at, what you're getting at is something which uh, I, I think haunts landscape architecture in a way, um, which is, which is the, 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 the idea that no, nobody's against landscape, right? Uh, in other words, landscape has a kind of, in its typical form, has a kind of mom and apple pie quality, right? You know, people will, community groups will, will organize uh, to uh, object to a particular building, they'll never object to a particular landscape. So, if, if, if we were going to find the edge in landscape, we would probably have to look, look somewhere else. And I think probably we would have to look uh, towards these catastrophic sites, to these contaminated sites, sites that operate on a completely different scale. Um, you know, I, I, um, there's a line in uh, Mike Davis's book about, um, about Los Angeles. Uh, where he says, um, yeah, I mean, interesting, you know, picking up on your East Coast, West Coast thing, you know, he says basically the, the models that came from Europe and the East Coast, which were gradualist models for uh, the evolution of landscape, just don't work in Los Angeles. He says that, that LA is like Walden Pond on LSD. So, so maybe we have to find that, that landscape moment to work from. <laughs>